First Wednesdays is sponsored by the Vermont Humanities Council and by the Kellogg Hubbard Library, with video production supported by Orca Media. Good evening. Welcome to another First Wednesdays program sponsored by the Vermont Humanities Council. I'm Tom McCone, Executive Director of the Kellogg Hubbard Library. We are the local hosts for this series. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to read a note from the Vermont Humanities Council. On behalf of the Council, I welcome you here this evening. We hope that this talk will inspire you and help you to feel closer to the communities around you. The recent incidents in Pittsburgh and Kentucky that were motivated by hate remind us of the commitment that we made after the racist violence in Charlottesville last year. At that time, the Vermont Humanities Council drafted the following statement with our colleagues at the Vermont Arts Council. We are deeply troubled by the recent violence and expressions of hatred and bigotry that go against our fundamental ideals, the ideals that define our country. We know the arts and humanities have the power to create and nurture empathy, promote thoughtful reflection, heal, and advance understanding among people whose lives are vastly different from our own. The staff and boards of the Vermont Arts Council and the Vermont Humanities Council rededicate themselves to the vital work of promoting inclusion, tolerance, and understanding, and building creative, healthy, and welcoming communities for all. With that statement in mind, you will see that the Council's programming in 2018 and 19 calls for reflection and action to end hate and to promote inclusion. Tonight in Essex Junction, Nicholas Ma is discussing his documentary film, Won't You Be My Neighbor? It focuses on the life and work of Fred Rogers, whose iconic children's show was filmed in Pittsburgh. In fact, Mr. Rogers lived in Squirrel Hill, the site of last week's horrific attack on the Tree of Life Synagogue. People of all races, classes, colors, and creeds were inspired by Fred Rogers' kindness, compassion, and empathy. Like him, we hope that our work will help build understanding and turn strangers into neighbors. That many Americans continue to experience hate and bias, and that such violence appears to be escalating is deeply troubling and calls us to action. Please join with us to reject this violence and to work for a kinder and more thoughtful world. And thank you for being part of the conversation. In memory of all the victims of hate violence, but especially those we lost in the past few weeks, we say with our Jewish brothers and sisters, May their memory be for a blessing. Thank you. Tonight's program has a very relevant theme, of course. News, fake news, and democracy in America. The statewide underwriters are the Alma Gibbs Donchian Foundation, the Wyndham Foundation, and the Institute of Museum and Libraries through the Vermont Department of Libraries. The underwriter for this talk is the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation in partnership with Pulitzer Prizes. The host for this series is the Kellogg Hubbard Library. Part of our role as host includes uh, paying for part of the funding of the programs. And I want to make sure you know that because uh, many of you are uh, donors and taxpayers who support our library, and I think it's important for you to know how we spend our time and how we spend our money. 
and thank you for your support always. Tonight's speaker is Mark Potok. For 20 years, he helped lead the Southern Poverty Law Center's work in monitoring the extreme right in the United States. Potok served as director of the SPLC's Intelligence Project, editor-in-chief of its award-winning investigative magazine, Intelligence Report, and later as senior fellow at, um, at the SPLC until leaving in 2017. He was a key spokesman for the SPLC and has testified before the Senate, the Helsinki Commission, and the United Nations Commission on High, uh, excuse me, Commission on Human Rights, as well as other important venues. Before joining SPLC, Potok, who was raised in Plainfield, Vermont, spent almost 20 years as an award-winning reporter at USA Today, the Miami Herald, and the Dallas Times Herald. Among other related topics, he has studied the role of conspiracy theories, fake news, and the press on the far right. He is now a senior fellow at the Center for Analysis of the Radical Right. And I know for uh, some of us, the takeaway there is that in one sentence just about, we have the Senate, the Helsinki Commission, the United Nations High, uh, High Commission on Human Rights, and Plainfield, Vermont. So, <laughs> would you please join me in welcoming Mark Potok. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me, inviting me home again. And I want to say hi especially to my brothers and sisters, brother and sisters and father, and old friends, mostly old. <laughs> Emphasis on the old. Um, I thought I would talk tonight about not only fake news, but fake news, conspiracy theories, propaganda, those things are all kind of in the same world together. I'd talk a little bit for uh, starters, just to remind you some of what was said about Pittsburgh and about the uh, mail, the pipe bomb mail bomber and so on run through some conspiracy theories and kind of common things we're seeing and then talk a little bit about the causes uh, and perhaps things uh, we can do uh, to combat this sort of plague. Uh, I don't think I'm telling anybody anything new when I say that, you know, this talk follows by one day uh, an election that was surely among uh, the most affected or at least swimming in fake news uh, and propaganda in the in, in really modern history. Uh, perhaps along with 2016 election of Trump. Uh, you know, my position, I'm speaking as a journalist uh, for a long time, 40 years, 20 before the Southern Poverty Law Center and 20 running their investigative magazine. Um, you know, I started at a little tough uh, news bureau called City News Bureau in Chicago, which maybe some people have heard of. Uh, the main reason I mention that is because they had a wonderful uh, saying there attributed to a, a now dead editor, a guy named Dorfman. If your mother says she loves you, check it out. Right? And that, <laughs> that was our rule. And uh, uh, Paul Zimbrakis, our editor, was very much a hard ass on this rule. And uh, we, of course, we also had to memorize every street name in Chicago uh, and so on. Uh, maybe more apropos. Uh, to what we're saying, Jonathan Swift once wrote, you know, falsehood flies and the truth comes limping after it. Uh, even earlier, Francis Bacon in 1625 wrote an essay called Of Suspicion, uh, in which he said, and this really relates to conspiracy theories, there is nothing makes a man suspect much more than to know little. That, that is, uh, uh, I think, especially so, as I've learned really over 20 years at the Southern Poverty Law Center. Uh, when it comes from authority figures. Also, there are many studies that back that up, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but th that is really uh, perhaps my most important message tonight, is that it really matters uh, when people in the position of, say, Donald Trump or any number of others, I mean, including the Sean Hannity's of the world and so on, uh, those lies matter. Uh, they spread, they poison democracy in a really pernicious way. Uh, you know, we're right now in the middle of, of an epidemic uh, of fake news, of propaganda, of conspiracy theories in a way that we haven't seen. I mean, I feel like I have been trying to warn, uh, you know, the world or the country or whatever of this for 25 years, 
uh, and it's only now in the last uh, two or three become you know absolutely apparent to everyone that the SPLC or me personally or whoever you know it's no we're not making up a story to frighten people and raise money this is real uh, there is a genuine and scary uh, resurgence of the of right-wing populism and arguably of uh, proto-fascism. In any case, I just want to mention uh, a little bit about, first of all, the mail bomber, uh, Cesar Sayoc, the guy who sent uh, all those uh, mail bomb, pipe bomb mail packages. I think that, you know, despite what you heard on uh, Fox News and in various other outlets, there's just no question at all uh, that this guy's rage was channeled by Donald Trump directly. I mean, it's rare you get such a direct case. Uh, you know, as his lawyer said afterward, uh, this guy was a very weak man, uh, sort of weak uh, character-wise. Uh, the lawyer described him as like a 15-year-old boy who needed a father figure, and in fact, his father did abandon him when he was young. Uh, you know, he's very much the kind of forgotten man, or at least saw himself that way, uh, that Trump talked about when he first won office. Uh, you know, every single target, I'm sure everyone in the room realizes, that was uh, every single person, every organization that was targeted by Sayoc had been vilified and demonized repeatedly in incredible numbers by Donald Trump. So just to mention a few of them. CNN was described as, you know, the enemy of the people, a place of hatred and extreme bias. Uh, you know, and you remember some of the doctored videos Trump uh, produced of him, you know, having a, tra a train run over CNN and having him sock CNN in the face and so on. That was 63 times uh, Trump went after CNN since the election. Uh, I'm excluding the campaign completely. Uh, George Soros. Uh, same thing again and again. You know, George Soros was financing the caravan. George Soros is bringing in MS-13, uh, dangerous Middle Easterners. Uh, George Soros is leading an assault on our country. Uh, we need to send military to the border, which of course Trump has done. Uh, and you may uh, have noticed uh, that uh, in the middle of all this, Donald Trump Jr., the son, retweeted uh, a neo-Nazi post in which Soros was described as the Nazi who turned in fellow Jews. So without going into details, uh, I will assure you that all of that is completely false about Soros. Now, you know, Obama. Obama wasn't an American. He was born in Kenya. Uh, you know, and, and when uh, that was more or less shot down by the release of the long-term birth certificate, you'll remember that Trump said, well, anyway, he certainly couldn't have succeeded at Harvard and Yale the way he did, right? Obviously, uh, uh, there was cheating going on there. You know, he didn't need to say it's because he's black and a quote-unquote low, low IQ individual. Uh, you know, 109 times he went after Hillary Clinton uh, since the election as a criminal, lock her up, and so on. And I'll just point out this sort of amusing side irony of, of course, this was all over the email server, and, you know, it just came out a few days in the New York Times that Donald Trump talks on his personal iPhone all the time, and, you know, Chinese intelligence is sitting there listening to every word. So, in other words, vastly more outrageous uh, than anything uh, Clinton did, but there it is. Maxine Waters, 73 times, he called her a low IQ individual. Uh, you know, he said uh, at, the, at the rally in Nevada, in the middle of all this, in between the pipe bombs and the Pittsburgh massacre, uh, that the Democrats are, quote, an angry, ruthless, unhinged mob. They're evil, they're destroying the country, they're wrecking the borders, they're backing MS-13, and so on. Uh, you know, again, this, uh, these ideas come from someplace. Uh, in, in many cases, they come uh, directly from Trump, but the vast majority of things boil up from a different milieu, uh, the, the world I've been studying, the radical right for the last 20, 25 years. That is really, uh, just to look at, let's look just at one example of Soros, the attacks on Soros. This really began in the neo-Nazi world and then was amplified uh, by the whole right-wing media apparatus right, from Fox News to the Drudge Report and all the rest of it, Tucker Carlson and so on. But very quickly from there, it has jumped out, and this is uh, typical of much of the kind of propaganda I'm uh, going to be talking about tonight, uh, into the political world. So it wasn't so long ago that a former congressman by the name of Jack Kingston, a uh, Republican in Georgia, described Soros uh, and other secret activists as being behind the Parkland High School shooting, the massacre in Florida in February of 2018. Uh, some of you may have seen in the papers that the Vice President of Campbell's Soup just had to resign. He's their chief lobbyist uh, because he described Soros as having arranged, this he stated as a matter of fact, troop carriers uh, and rail cars uh, to help the caravan attack America. 
this uh, supposedly military caravan that's coming up here, uh, you know, thick with tourists and gangsters and so on. Uh, a congressman named Representative uh, Matt Gates, or another Republican from Florida, uh, said just a couple weeks ago the caravan was funded by Soros. I will note for the record that he was reelected last night. Pat Robertson of the Bible Network, same thing. Soros funded the, the, paragram, the, the caravan, I'm sorry. Bill O'Reilly, he's off the charts dangerous. And let me say as a quick aside about Bill O'Reilly, who I have a particular animus towards, so I'm looking at right up front. Uh, Bill, a couple of things about him. First of all, Bill O'Reilly, uh, some of you may remember, referred to a physician in Kansas by the name of George Tiller as Tiller the Killer. He did this over 200 times, uh, and uh, sometimes Tiller the Baby Killer. George Tiller was a late-term uh, abortion physician uh, who, at, after all of this name-calling by uh, O'Reilly, which he never said a word of apology about, was murdered, uh, shot to death in the foyer of his own church. Uh, it goes on and on. I told the story a little earlier tonight about uh, Bill O'Reilly, uh, completely concocting the story, I mean, out of thin air. This is uh, over 10 years ago, uh, in which he said that there were hundreds of gangs of lesbian women armed with pink pistols terrorizing the United States by ordering sex toys on the internet and raping middle school girls with them. And there was more, it was very bad. Um, but it turned out, I, I happen to know this story well because we spent some time debunking it at the Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, but let me tell you, this was concocted out of whole cloth. They had all kinds of film. It turned out that every piece of film they used in this piece uh, was from a story that had nothing to do you know, with lesbians or pink pistols or anything. You know, uh, O'Reilly, thanks to us, had to apologize the following day, you know, about a five paragraph apology, uh, explaining that he was wrong on every single score. There were hundreds of gangs, none were called with pink pistols, except for one in Texas or Colorado, I guess it was. They made a big apology to them. Anyway, it was kind of funny at the time. Uh, but, you know, these stories have an impact, right? It's not just a weird and wild story about pink pistols and lesbians. Uh, you know, it's a vilification of lesbian women, uh, which very much fits in with the kind of propaganda that comes from the whole Christian right about, you know, what those people do, what those LGBT people really do, how they're coming after your children, and so on. And just to go on for a second about Soros, right? I mean, Alex, Alex Jones, you all know probably, is you know, kind of the conspiracy theorist in chief of the United States, a radio, internet radio show host uh, in Austin, who uh, you will remember Trump actually gave an interview to during the campaign and said to Alex Jones, you've got an amazing reputation, Alex. Uh, well, Alex Jones has described Soros as fundamentally evil. Even Viktor Orban, right, the premier of Hungary, uh, is running a billboard campaign which describes uh, George Soros as the enemy of the state. Also, immediately after these bombs came out, I'm speaking of fake news, what you saw uh, over a pretty significant portion of the right-wing media uh, were the claims of false flags, right? That this was not real. Uh, this had been cooked up. Uh, one person even made the claim that it was uh, the left. Right, that somehow created this bombing campaign and aimed at all at the targets that Trump has mentioned so many times, you know, as an attempt to uh, somehow vilify the right and so on. Uh, you know, one particular right-wing media pundit guy named John Cardillo uh, said that it was Antifa. Right, these were Antifa people who had really done uh, the mail bombs. Uh, Michael Flynn Jr., the son of the former National Security Advisor, right, Trump's National Security Advisor described in a tweet as a total false flag operation. Somebody else, an anti-Muslim ideologue by the name of Frank Gaffney, uh, said that this was all just to deflect from the leftist mobs, right? Jobs, not mobs, that whole idea. You know, the slight kind of awful irony in all of this is that when all of this came to light, uh, and the Wednesday when all of the other bombs, uh, aside from the one that Soros uh, became known, <laughs> that day was actually supposedly Unity Day, which is a part of National Bullying Prevention Month. Uh, you know, their, their slogan being kindness, acceptance, and inclusion. So, what a world. Uh, you know, a, a couple of days later, of course, we had the attack on the Tree of Life Synagogue uh, in Pittsburgh. And, you know, this guy was another guy who uh, I would argue was very definitely influenced by the Trump milieu, if in a less direct way, uh, than Donald Trump himself. Uh, you know, as he, he posted before he went in there, it's the filthy evil Jews bringing the filthy evil Muslims into the country. So it's the idea of the caravan. 
right, that uh, somehow the powers that be, in his case, were real neo-Nazi, it's the Jews, but that the bad people, the left, the Jews, uh, are bringing in immigrants in order to destroy us and our society. It's true that the uh, shooter, Robert Bowers, uh, was mildly critical of Trump, Trump, but that was only because he was saying, you know, the Jews are still here. Trump hasn't gotten rid of the Jews. So it wasn't that he was some kind of enemy of Trump, uh, as he was portrayed on Fox and some other venues at all. Um, and, you know, he was clearly taking his cues from the radical right and, and views that have been amplified in a huge way by Trump. Immigrants are racists, they're killers, they're drug dealers, terrorists, uh, and so on. Uh, let me say just briefly in talking about you know, the sources where these ideas come from, that there has been over the last really 40 years a kind of Nazification of the American radical right. And what I mean by that is you know, where the radical right was once dominated by Klan groups and so on, that were really aimed prime, you know, they certainly were not uh, friendly to Jews, but their main target was not uh, the Jews. Uh, but that has changed a lot, as I said, in the last 40 years, that more and more when you look at radical groups across the board, even including groups like militia groups, uh, the majority of them now see as the evil behind all other evils is the Jews, right, who are up to all of these bad things. Uh, the other thing I think to say about that particular attack is just to recall some of the things that Donald Trump uh, did in terms of talking about the Jews. Yes, we know he has a you know, Jewish daughter, uh, Jewish son-in-law, and so on, but let's remember that towards the end of the campaign, uh, they ran an ad with the Star of David superimposed on a heap of money. This was Hillary Clinton. You know, it was outright anti-Semitism. Uh, that his very last ad uh, in the campaign uh, talked about the global power structure, said it has robbed our working class, stripped our country of its wealth. And this is, of course, while well, the running pictures of Janet Yellen, the Federal Reserve Chairman, George Soros, and Roy Blankfein, the Goldman Sachs CEO, all Jewish, of course. So, you know, I mean, to say there's been a kind of dog whistling, I think, is understating it quite a bit. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, Julia Ioffe, maybe some of you have heard of her, she's a very fine Jewish uh, uh, journalist, uh, wrote you know, about Trump and the whole question of can you lay this at Trump's feet. You know, his role is to set the tone. Their role is to do the rest, meaning the killers, the shooters. Uh, you know, I'd note just one other thing briefly, which was in the same few days, uh, we had a guy walk into a Louisville Kroger supermarket uh, and murder two black people because they were black. This was after he tried to get into a black church but couldn't get in because they saw him banging on the doors, uh, like in Charleston, uh, a few years ago and tried to get in. They locked the door, so he went next door to the supermarket and murdered the first two black people he saw. Uh, and it is also right around the same time we saw two people murdered uh, in a yoga shop. And you know this was by one of the so-called incel uh, warriors, incel being short for involuntary celibates. These are the people who are mad because, you know, beautiful girls won't go out with them and by God they think they deserve that and are owed that and maybe some of you remember, uh, among others, Elliot Roger, uh, the Santa Barbara uh, mass murder. He killed, I think, seven people, if I remember, in a rage because, you know, he's a virgin and women haven't given him what he wants and so on. And, you know, I mention this, it's not quite as off topic as it sounds maybe, in the sense that you know, misogyny, real life violent hatred of women is much, much more uh, a part of the radical right than it was even 10 years ago. So this whole men's rights movement, the incel warrior movement and so on, uh, long live Elliot Rogers, all of this uh, has really become a part of the radical right in just the last few years in a very big way. And of course that's very much personalized in the person uh, of Donald Trump, who is, uh, I think it goes without saying, uh, quite a misogynist of his own. <clears throat> you know, at this point, I would say, uh, you know, we are drowning, really, in a sea of fake news and conspiracy theories, as I think I tried to say at the beginning. I mean, this is something I think has been growing for quite a while. It didn't come out of absolutely nowhere, uh, but it is really remarkable. And just to run through, I think I, I should tell you a few, a few of these ideas that are kicking around and uh, more than kicking around. They're really very much alive in the society. You know, once upon a time, the idea of white genocide and by once upon a time, I mean only seven or eight years ago, the idea of white genocide uh, you know, was an absolutely whacked out idea that originated on the real neo-Nazi right, right? I mean, these weren't politicians at all. These were people who marched around the swastikas on their arms. You know, and it was a bit of a crazy idea because 
you know, there's a genocide being committed against white people. Well, what they really mean uh, is that people aren't having babies that are 100% pure white. So, you know, every time a baby is born that has, you know, 1% quote unquote non white blood, that's genocide, right? That's, that's what's happening to white people. It's, you know, so it's, it's a bit of a ridiculous fantasy. But, you know, it moved very quickly, uh, as you know, from real neo Nazi groups like the Daily Stormer. Uh, you know, incredible uh, Nazi site, uh, right into the White House, right? So Trump is talking about the idea of white genocide. Excuse me for a second. Can we move the microphone? Sure, closer? I'm sorry. Are people, people having a hard time hearing me? I'm sorry. Okay. <clears throat> you know, that is repeated by Tucker Carlson, people like that. Pizza Gate, I'm sure everyone remembers, uh, storming into Cosmic Pizza uh, in Washington, D.C., because it was thought on the right that Hillary Clinton was secretly running a pedophile, you know, pedophilia ring. Uh, out of this pizza parlor for God knows what reason. And you know, when they arrested the guy who fired off a shot but didn't actually hit anyone and let him off uh, into the police van, you know, he turned to the cops and said, well, you know, I guess the intel on that wasn't 100%. Yeah, no kidding. <clears throat> uh, you know, Alex Jones, we've mentioned already, Alex Jones is really the principal author of the idea that virtually every major terrorist attack of the last years, right, Oklahoma City, the Boston Marathon, Pulse nightclub, all of that, uh, these were false flag operations. And you know, the idea of false flag operations really originates with the militia movement, even before Alex Jones. And you know, it's this fundamental, this, this, this kind of fundamental conspiracy theory, which is the government is involved in these things to scare the hell out of the rest of us so that it can then pass it, the evil government can then pass uh, draconian anti-terrorism legislation come in, take away all our guns, anyone who resists, thrown into concentration camps, and so on. So, you know, it's a big involved theory, uh, but, you know, there are now uh, hundreds of thousands, arguably millions of people who believe things like that, who believe uh, that Sandy Hook was carried out by crisis actors and no children were really killed, and so on. Uh, you know, and then there are the kind of incredibly pernicious uh, and much older uh, conspiracy theories, or, or fake news, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, one of the most pernicious is the idea that gay men orchestrated the Holocaust. Uh, this began with a guy named Scott Lively, who's a quote-unquote Christian minister, uh, who wrote this in a book called The Pink Swastika, in which he argued, uh, you know, that the only reason that, that the Nazis recruited uh, sort of dominant gay men because they were the only ones who were vicious enough to carry out the kinds of things uh, that they needed to carry out in concentration camps and so on. And you know, again, I don't need to tell you that's you know utterly false. The, uh, the anti-Muslim uh, uh, propaganda out there is just you know uh, drowning us. Uh, it is at an incredible level. Uh, you know, in in some ways, the most pernicious of those ideas has have started with a guy named David Yerushalmi who's a right-wing, very pro-Israel, he's part of the settlers movement, although he's an American citizen. Uh, David Yerushalmi came up with an I the idea that there was a secret plot to impose Sharia law, uh, Islamic religious law in American courts. And that was way back in 2010, and uh, for whatever it's worth, just to make one small point about this, uh, after Yerushalmi did that, made this very public, and states started to adopt, or at least consider adopting, and my state, Alabama, for instance, has adopted an anti-Sharia uh, law, uh, this idea went all around the country. At the very same time, in 2010, uh, that was when a woman named Pam Geller was ginning up these big uh, uh, demonstrations in New York uh, against the so-called Ground Zero Mosque. People probably remember the Islamic Center in Lower Manhattan. I mention that only because hate crimes against Muslims had been going down at that point ever since 2001, ever since immediately after 9-11. Obviously, there was a huge spike in anti-Muslim hate crimes then. They've been going down, 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 down until 2010. And there were no Islamist attacks in this country or any major attacks in Europe in 2010 as it happens. So the two things that really happened were Yara Shalmi's theory about Sharia law, uh, and, uh, you know, all the uh, uh, noise about the Ground Zero Mosque. That resulted, or in any case, what happened was a 67% increase in anti-Muslim hate crimes that year, uh, according to the FBI hate crime statistics. So, you know, words have consequences. <clears throat>
Uh, just to go on quickly, for you know, there's a Common Core. It's an educational curriculum that was proposed, kind of standardized uh, standards around the country. And you know, one can argue for and against it for various reasons, legitimate reasons. But in the South, particularly, Common Core uh, is seen as a secret plot uh, to enclose, impose essentially Marxist ideas on Southern schools and so on. Uh, there was a county commissioner actually who said a kind of amusing thing in Alabama where I live. Uh, you know, when I heard the, the words Common Core, I knew it was communism, right? So that's about the level of thinking. You may remember uh, that uh, in Texas a couple of years ago, they had a military exercise, which was basically an exercise for troops that were going overseas called Operation Jade Helm. It was going to involve some exercises in several southwestern states, uh, including Texas. Well, you know, this fit in to that old militia idea of they're getting ready to impose martial law on us, they're going to take our guns and so on. Uh, and there was a lot of uh, screaming about that. And as a matter of fact, there were people who made a claim uh, that there had been something like 40 Bluebell ice cream trucks, which had been converted to rolling mortuaries to deal with all the bodies uh, that were going to result when they tried to impose martial law and take our weapons. They also had a particularly whacked out theory uh, about Walmarts in several states, abandoned Walmarts being connected uh, by secret underground tunnels. So this is how the conspirators were going to carry out their, their un-American uh, uh, plans. Uh, and it goes on and on and on. Uh, what else? North, there's a theory called either the Plandatslan, uh, or sometimes it's called the North American Union, but basically the idea is, is there is a plot. The Plan de Atzlan is a plot on the part of Mexico to reinvade or to invade and reconquer the American Southwest, take back 11 states in the Southwest. The NAU, the North American Union, is the idea that there's a secret plot among the elites, right? The people in government uh, and other world elites to merge the United States, Canada, and Mexico. And this is going to be in order, you know, to wring the last drop out of blood out of the, you know, the regular guy, the poor workers out there. Uh, you know, and other terrible things are going to happen too, like we're going to be forced to spend the amado. They're going to take away the dollar. So I have to spend this nasty piece of currency. Uh, Agenda 21, probably a lot of people in this room know that. I mean, that is essentially a toothless UN plan that dates back to the Rio summit, I think in 1992, if I remember. And you know, what it basically said was, we should plan for the 21st century. We should encourage communities to plan uh, for you know, the preservation of global resources and so on, right? Smart planning. Well, this very quickly became first uh, in the world of the John Birch Society, uh, the group that accused uh, President Eisenhower of being a communist agent and so on. Uh, Agenda 21 was seen as a plot and described as a plot to impose Marxism on the United States. The incredible thing about it uh, is that when Mitt Romney was running, uh, the Republican Party actually adopted that as part of its national platform uh, before Romney was actually nominated. So this actually appears at one point in the Republican platform, that the uh, Agenda 21 is a plot to impose Marxism uh, and socialism on the United States. So let me not go on because it's kind of a long, long list. Uh, well, I'll mention one last one, uh, which is you know birtherism, and we all know about Donald Trump's role in birtherism, but uh, it also started very early on uh, on a website run by a, an ex sort of pseudo journalist named Joseph Farah called World That Daily, uh, and uh, you know that is the home of John Corsi, who wrote the big book on Obama, really, he's a Kenyan, and so on. Um, and uh, just to let you know what kind of site it is, we were talking earlier this evening with another group about <laughs> evaluating sources and so on. Uh, World Net Daily is also well known among some of us uh, as the organization that produced a six part series on how eating soy causes homosexuality. <laughs> so, <clears throat> those are the kind of groups we're talking about. I mean, a lot of it is amusing, and, and you know, I guess I mean it to be amusing, but my God, you know, the, the proportion of this stuff that is believed uh, by people who are in office right now, a number of whom won re-election last night, is incredible. So, just to go way, way back historically, you know, obviously, propaganda, fake news, false reporting, you know, false accusations didn't start, you know, with Trump or, or this century. I mean, you know, you go uh, back to the beginning, you know, the blood libel, right? The Jews are, 
secretly uh, abducting and killing Christian children and draining their blood to make matzah for the festivals and so on. Um, I mean, that's it, right? That's the, the, the blood blood. But, you know, but also what people may not remember, I, I just happen to remember this from books I read in college, is you know, how partisan the newspapers were during the colonial era. You know, vicious attacks uh, on one another. But of course, newspapers then were seen very differently, right? They were not seen uh, as purveyors, particularly of facts. They were the opinion uh, of this particular party or this group of people. So it was a bit different, uh, but those papers were filled with rather amazing uh, uh, <laughs> vitriol. There was a case, uh, this I just tell you for amusement's sake, because it's not really have much to do with the radical right, but the New York Sun ran a, a famous, really an infamous series in 1935, I'm sorry, in 1835, The Great Moon Hoax. And uh, this was, uh, uh, millions of Americans believed it, with the, that they had discovered life on the moon, there's all civilization, and it went on and on and on and on. And I guess the only lesson of that is how gullible people were. So people who wrote the story actually wrote it as a joke. And there are all kinds of clues uh, within the story, but you know, like with War of the Worlds, an enormous number of people thought it was true. You know, and then you think of other things like the uh, Spanish-American in the War, right? Started essentially by fake news, uh, promoted by you know, William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer. Uh, the turn of the century, this last of the 20th century, this is the publication of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which, you know, was the premier uh, anti-Semitic text, right, in which Jews are planning in a, you know, secretly in a graveyard uh, to destroy uh, the Christian world and so on. Through the Red Scares, right, the 1890s, 1910s, and 1950s, again and again. Uh, even uh, more recently, you know, the so-called War on Christmas, right? I mean, you would think that that's all Bill O'Reilly and John Gibson on Fox News, but in fact, uh, it began quite a little while ago with Henry Ford, uh, the infamous anti-Semite in the 1920s, who actually first made the claim uh, that Jews were conspiring against Christmas. So, you know, my only point is that there's been a lot of this through our history, but uh, in the last uh, century or so, uh, things changed quite a lot. I mean, the New York Times was started in 1896 pretty much explicitly uh, to combat this kind of coverage, right? These kinds of falsehood. They explicitly uh, announced themselves as this would be a fact-based newspaper, right? It was not gonna be uh, a bunch of tall tales and that what you read in the paper, you know, you could trust. And, you know, I'm not gonna make the argument that the New York Times has always been a perfect purveyor of that. Obviously, it was a new kind of journalism um, and really led uh, to a different uh, uh, news world, at least for quite a little while. You know, uh, certainly they weren't perfect, uh, the New York Times and other major papers of the early 20th century, but they were uh, good in the sense, well, let, let me say it another way. You know, if you think back to the 1960s, the country was very much divided, very much polarized. I guess you could argue about whether it's worse now or not, but you know, we're fighting over desegregation, over Vietnam, over counterculture, over smoking dope and, you know, sex and so on. And you know, so it was a very, very polarized society. But if you think back to that time, I think uh, you will realize that there was nothing like this going on in the news media or, or in any kind of media. Uh, meaning, every, you know, there were three networks at that time. Uh, they all basically reported more or less the same news. There were one or two newspapers in, in, in most towns. Again, they were pretty much operating off the same factual basis. So I'm not saying that there weren't some strange stories or some stories that weren't true, but I am saying that you know what was happening then was a big argument was happening in the country, but it was quite different than what we're living through now in that people were more or less arguing not about the facts, but about what they think should happen next or which way the society should go. They at least more or less agreed on what was happening. And I think obviously uh, television cameras during the civil rights movement were incredibly important to that, right? They just forced the fact on Northerners uh, you know, that something really horrible was going on south, right? You couldn't argue with pictures of those four little girls in their white dresses laid out, uh, you know, in the antechamber of the 16th Street Baptist Church uh, in Birmingham. So, <clears throat> I talked briefly, and I apologize to the people who heard this a little earlier this morning, but let me just say briefly that at that time, uh, there was a big argument about, okay, we're seeing the very beginnings of the kind of the rise of the radical right. The American uh, Nazi Party was really the first major uh, fascist post-war organization in this country. It was led by an old uh, uh, naval commander named George Lincoln Rockwell. 
And they were really, they were uniformed Nazis, right? They lived, they uh, were headquartered in Arlington, Virginia, right outside of DC. And uh, Rockwell had about 100 quote unquote stormtroopers, and they would dress up in, you know, stormtrooper outfits, SS caps and brown shirts, and all that, you know, tall white, tall black boots, and, and then all the rest, little fake Nazis. Uh, at the time, what I want to tell you about is just briefly, the major Jewish agencies in America adopted a policy trying to contain this kind of small but scary resurgence of anti-Semitism by adopting what they called a quarantine policy. Uh, and what that meant was they went around from newspaper to newspaper to television owner and essentially pleaded with the owners of these, of these media not to cover Rockwell. And you know, their argument was simple. It's like, look, you know, there's 50, 100 guys, they're, they're out of their minds. If you give them any press, it just helps them. There's no reason to help them. It's not going anywhere. Um, and they were quite successful. The quarantine policy really worked back then. You know, whatever one thinks about free speech or whether it was a good thing or not, it was actually pretty effective for a while. But really, two things happened. One, Rockwell started to understand he needed to be more and more and more outrageous, right, to get the, to, until the papers just couldn't resist him. And so he'd do things like, you know, this is the era of, uh, you know, Volkswagen buses painted with, uh, you know, psychedelic paint, and, you know, uh, you know, naked hippie girls and all the rest. Well, so he, he uh, cooked up a hate bus. He got a Volkswagen bus. Yes, we hate, you know, we hate, you know, blacks, Jews, et cetera. Those are not the words he used. Um, so that happened. The other thing uh, that happened that was much more important was, of course, ultimately, you know, the media developed into what it is today, right? Huge, multi-sourced, right? I mean, there's talk radio, shortwave radio, uh, you know, the internet, social media, I mean, it goes on and on and on and on. So all I'm saying is, is that now at this point, the idea of trying to pursue a policy of quarantine, it, it's ludicrous, right? I mean, even if, you, even if you don't have any sort of ethical problem with it or, or political problem, it's totally impossible, right? I mean, you can't suppress news like that. So I, I say in quarantine versus inoculation, because you know, that has always, that's been what I've thought for 20 years and certainly what SC, SPLC has been about is the idea of, you know, you've got to give the public, you've got to give people Tell them what these groups are really all about. Tell them, you know, tell them that World Net Daily believes that, you know, eating soy causes homosexuality, so they can then evaluate the rest of the things uh, that uh, WND World Net Daily has to say. So that said, let me talk a little bit uh, about the kind of causes, or at least what I think of are the causes. I mean, you know, ultimately, especially with regard to conspiracy theories, you know, it's obvious we live in a more and more and more complex world. And I, I don't think it's unkind or untrue to say, you know, conspiracy theories are an easy way for simple minds to make sense of a very complicated world, right? Uh, it's all, everything's got a cause, things don't just happen, you know, there's a reason for everything, and it all ultimately goes back, you know, typically to one or two malefactors. Uh, I would say that, you know, what we're talking about, fake news, uh, conspiracy theories, and so on, has come back it, with, you know, just with a vengeance uh, in the last 30 years. And I guess we've already talked about a whole bunch of examples of that. Uh, I think that, you know, some of the reasons are sort of technical. The internet, obviously, has allowed, you know, these voices uh, that didn't really have any way to reach the public to get all over the world. So that's been very important, obviously, the internet you know, diminishes any kind of inhibition, so you can call so-and-so whatever you like because they're not there and you don't have to sign uh, what, what you sent them and so on. The internet also helps people who felt very formerly isolated, you know, the lone Klansman in, you know, in, some, in Michigan somewhere, right, who finds out now via the internet he's not, right, so it allows uh, real movement building. Um, and also the internet has helped in this whole sort of margins to the mainstream. Uh, idea, this development that I've tried to describe a little of how, you know, ideas move from the extreme right to sometimes sort of interlocutors like the middle, like the uh, Minutemen groups and on into the political world and ultimately, uh, in this case, in many cases, up to the White House. I think, uh, though, probably uh, the most important, well, I don't know if the most, but yeah, probably the most important uh, factor in all of this, though, has been the role that you know, politicians, pundits, and preachers have played uh, in terms of amplifying uh, this kind of news and, and legitimizing it. Um, let, me, let me say a couple things about you know, the link between uh, uh, sort of propaganda and action. 
uh, first of all, for instance, the university, earlier this year, the University of Warwick uh, put out a study in which it found that Trump tweets about various enemies and hate crimes against those groups, Muslims, gay people, immigrants, uh, or highly correlated. Right? which doesn't necessarily prove causation, but they're highly correlated, which uh, very much suggests a causation. Um, and I mentioned already, well, no, this is something that I didn't mention, but uh, two things. When Trump was elected, you may remember that there was immediately a kind of Trump effect, uh, so that right after he was elected, in the two months that followed, there were something like 2,000 uh, attacks of various kinds on all kinds of minorities, all the people, including women, for being women, as women, uh, all kinds of people who felt that you know, the barriers had been lowered, that this is what the president believes, or this is what the ma major candidate for the presidency believes, uh, and now it's okay. So you know, we saw things like, uh, some of you may remember that right after, not quite right, about two months after Trump was elected, there was a, a homeless Latino man in Boston who was uh, spotted by a couple of brothers returning late at night from a Red Sox game, who saw him and beat him up with lead pipes, uh, broke his fingers, urinated on him, and then were arrested a few minutes later and said to the cops, uh, arresting them, well, this Donald Trump says, you know, he's our enemy, and uh, so it's okay. And then they also went on to complain that uh, it's only white people who ever get arrested in this country, you know, why don't they arrest minorities and so on. Um, so one thing we saw related to that, well, that, so that's right after uh, the election. The other thing that I think relates to the same idea pretty strongly is that we saw the exact same thing in the United Kingdom after the Brexit vote. I mean, if you think about the Brexit vote, the vote to leave uh, the European Union, it was very much the same voters, the same kinds of people who voted for Trump. People who were, came from, uh, well, in their case, the North Counties, you know, these poor deindustrializing areas, areas that had a lot of troubles, white working class, uh, and so on. Uh, in any case, uh, immediately after the Brexit vote, there, uh, the United Kingdom saw the exact same thing that we saw after Trump was elected, a huge rash uh, of hate crimes, of halal grocery stores being burned to the ground, you know, people being attacked uh, on trams and so on. To step back just a minute, at the very beginning of Trump's campaign, uh, which was 2015, of course, he, I'm sure everybody remembers how he started with a speech about Mexicans are rapists and drug dealers, and, you know, they're not sending us their best and so on. Uh, the very, that year, uh, hate crimes, anti-Muslim hate crimes went up 60%, uh, pretty clearly as a result of that. Um, there is another interesting study of a couple of years ago, 2017, by the, you know, the professors from the University of Chicago uh, from Northwestern and UCLA. And it's a sort of complicated study to describe, and I, and I won't, it's too complicated, but what they found was that they were asking people if they would give a donation to an anti-immigrant hate group. And this particular hate group had said something like, um, America has to retain a European majority, a European-American majority. This was essentially flat out, you know, pro-white, anti-non-white, anti uh, racist group. What they found was that if these people, these subjects in the study, this was during the campaign, before Trump won, if they were told that Trump would definitely win, well, if they, were t if they thought that Trump was not going to win, they were told that he's, there's no chance he can't win by the researchers, then only 34% of them would have okayed a check off on their check to this group, right? So 34% of them would have, would have supported this anti-immigrant hate group. If they were convinced Trump was going to win, in other words, he would win, and his views, saying immigrants are, are scum and so on, uh, were public, then 54% would be, uh, would say, yeah, uh, it can be public, right? You can tell the world that and, and uh, uh, you know, and I'll approve that. Um, so, it, it, you know, so what it shows, obviously, is it's just that idea of, you know, giving somehow legitimization. If the guy at the top says it's okay, you feel that it's now okay to say these things. What else? Obviously, Fox News has played uh, an incredibly important role in this, at least in my opinion. Uh, there have been lots of fun studies about Fox News, uh, but you know, the kind of the bottom line was from a 2015 studies that showed that people who watch Fox News are less informed, or rather more misinformed about the world than people who watch zero news at all, right? They pay no attention to the news. As I said, it kind of tells you what you need to know about Fox. Obviously, Russian interference played some part in 
this, although I don't think it was probably all that important, but who knows. Uh, another study uh, from M MIT earlier this year, they, they found that essentially it was looking at how lies and falsehoods travel uh, amongst people, amongst communities. What they found was that a false story reaches 1,500 people six times faster than a true one. Uh, they also found that falsehoods were 70% more likely to be retweeted than true ones. And they looked at the theory, which of course a lot of people thought that these were bots, right? That these were automatic functions that were happening uh, and these false stories were simply being amplified by robots so you couldn't really uh, make much of a statement about it, but it turned out that that wasn't true because when they analyzed what the bots were doing, what they found was the bots amplify true news vastly more uh, than they amplify falsehoods. Uh, so the bottom line uh, was that they, they found, you know, human beings, this is because of human beings. Human beings prefer novelty, they like emotion-based uh, news, and this, these are the kinds of ideas uh, that travel the fastest. You know, finally, talking about causes for, you know, both fake news and so on and, and what it causes in terms of uh, crime and so on. You know, I just say looking at the very big picture historically, you know, we are living through, I mean, many times giving another talk just about the rise of hate groups and, and so on, I'll say, um, uh, you know, people like to believe that uh, these are a bunch of crazy people or they're like Bill O'Reilly, they're just making money off the, you know, off of sort of provo pro provoking these ideas uh, and engaging on these attacks and so on. But I would argue that there are actually huge historical factors at work that we are going, and really what I'm talking about in a sense is globalization. Uh, there are huge changes happening in this country and in the European countries that are going through these same struggles uh, with the rise of the radical right. Uh, you know, I'm sure I don't need to tell you that by the year 2044, they're now saying uh, non-Hispanic whites will lose their majority in this country. So, you know, we have been a 90% white country from the colonial era until the early 60s. Uh, and, you know, uh, now it's only now beginning to change. We're now, I think, about 63%. Uh, but in a very short time, uh, whites will be simply another minority. Uh, and that, I mean, you hear it in the news. You hear it even listening to politicians now. Uh, it used to be that people didn't really talk about that very openly, but now you hear politicians uh, actually talking about that in, you know, worried terms. Uh, the other piece of, or another piece of globalization is, of course, economics, what happens to people, and people are hurt. I mean, I, I'm not one who believes that globalization is really stoppable. I mean, it's this huge force. I just don't think that uh, you can decide that it's not going to happen. Uh, but the reality is, is that huge swaths uh, of workers, I mean, if you were in the car, if you're in the auto industry, or in steel, or in textiles, you're not doing well. And, and that is because of globalization. That is because of the move of certain kinds of jobs uh, to other places. Also, at the same time, huge cultural changes, right? And just to use the simplest uh, example, you know, who 15 years ago could have imagined that same-sex marriage would be legal in 50 states in this country, right? Didn't see, I mean, a little like Barack Obama, right? I mean, I never thought I'd live to see a black president. So, you know, these are huge changes. Uh, and I, I would argue that there's some similarity historically to what's going on now, not between now and the 30s in Germany, you know, the immediately pre-fascist period, uh, but more like uh, in between now and the 1920s in the United States. You know, I think maybe some people have a kind of false idea of the 20s that it was all, you know, speakeasies and, you know, good-looking flappers and, you know, a lot of, a lot of drinking and all that and, and fun, um, which was a part of what happened in the 20s. But, you know, what people, I think, don't largely remember is that the 1920s began with the terrible collapse of farm prices uh, in rural America. So the rural parts of this country were in bad trouble. The 1920 census was the first census that showed a majority of Americans were now urban dwellers rather than rural. So it was this huge transformation from a country that was essentially rural uh, to one that was becoming industrialized and urbanized. Um, you know, communities, obviously, uh, rural communities were falling apart. People in the cities were very much alienated, living in their little places. At the same time, you know, women were given the right to vote. Women were entering the workplace. Sex was more out in the open in many ways in terms of, the, you know, that world, flappers and the jazz age and all of that. Um, uh, and other things were happening too. Prohibition, 
you know, large levels of Catholic immigration to a country still dominated by Protestants. Uh, the Scopes trial in 1925, so traditional religion is also under attack. So there are these huge, you know, uh, really uh, uh, sociological, you know, economic changes that are happening that are very big, that, you know, leave a lot of people feeling left behind. Uh, you know, and in the case of the 20s, uh, it kind of culminated in a sense uh, with the passage of the 1924 Immigration Act, which is the racist quota system, which was in place until 1965, which heavily favored, uh, you know, essentially all that allowed in were Northern European whites, right? So, I mean, even Southern Europeans were, you know, too non-white for us back then. Um, and it was only because of the 1965 uh, Immigration Act, Ted Kennedy's reform of the immigration system, that the country is now as diverse as it is. Um, the other, other piece of what was going on back then that's very similar to what's happening now is that in 1910 and 1920, those were the highest proportions of foreign-born people in this country in our history. So 1910 was the all-time peak, 14.7%. Um, now we're, we're almost there, uh, and we're going to surpass it. It looks like we're going to hit 15 and a half or something like that before long, the next couple of years. So, you know, all of these things, uh, I think, you know, contribute to this feeling, you know, this isn't the country I grew up in, uh, you know, other people are taking over and so on. And in the case of the 20s, uh, as I said, you know, it produced uh, this terrible immigration act, which, uh, you know, when, when LBJ signed the 65 Act, getting rid of it, he talked about it as un-American, you know, talked openly about it as a racist, uh, uh, you know, millstone that had been around our neck all at that time. So I think we're in a similar time and, you know, we had Donald Trump as a president, arguably as a result uh, of all that's going on. So, you know, to talk briefly a little bit about consequences of all this, hate crimes are going up. You know, sometimes you'll hear some reporting in the press that I think kind of overhypes the hate crime numbers um, because we don't really know. The FBI hate crime uh, statistics are very weak, but there's one thing there's no question about is that uh, in the last years we've seen a rise, especially in anti-Muslim hate crimes, uh, and also anti-Latino hate crimes. That's clear. The other th another thing to say is that uh, terrorism has reached very, a very a bad place uh, with regard to terrorism, and terrorism specifically from the right. Uh, the ADL uh, just recently put out a report showing that you know, 18 of 34 quote-unquote extremist-related murders last year were by right-wing extremists. So for ever since 9-11, obviously 9-11 is a different story, but ever since then, we've seen more of a threat and more death, more killings uh, in general uh, from the radical right uh, rather than from you know, Islamists, Muslim extremists, whatever you want to call them. And you know, this is denied all the time uh, by Donald Trump, by people like Peter King. You may remember, Peter King's a congressman from New York who you may remember held a series of hearings which were essentially, you know, what's wrong with Muslims. They were purported to be a, a series of hearings on terrorism, but there was a big fight over whether and should you include, you know, Democrats were saying, well, let's look at all forms of terrorism. Uh, and King just simply denied that there was such a thing. It was an amazing thing because on the day of the uh, first hearing opened, King gave a little opening speech uh, in which he talked about how there are no neo-Nazi uh, terror, there's no neo-Nazi terror, any kind of white supremacist terror in this country. And it was funny because that very day, uh, they arrested a guy in Idaho who had attempted to kill about a thousand people uh, marching in the Martin Luther King March uh, earlier that year on MLK Day uh, with a huge bomb that he built, which they actually discovered and were able to dismantle. So you know, all I'm saying is he's, he's utterly full of it, uh, but this is the kind of thing uh, that you see again and again and again. Um, you know, increasingly, uh, you know, I think it's I'm saying anything revelatory to say that, you know, violence is seen as an answer uh, by very large swaths of people. Uh, and I think, uh, I would argue strongly, that Trump is very much uh, one of those responsible for this. You know, I, I think many people don't remember that during the rallies, during Trump rallies, it happened in Mobile, Alabama, you know, again, where I live, uh, Trump literally encouraged violence. Uh, I'd like to sock him in the face. At one point, uh, you may remember, there was a young black guy, Black Lives Matter guy, being led out of a stadium by the cops. Uh, and this man came up and sucker punched him right in the stomach. Uh, very, you know, really a nasty attack. Uh, 
Uh, and Trump at that point told the audience that he would pay the legal expenses of anybody who got in trouble for beating up at people uh, at his rallies. Uh, you know, you also probably remember what he said about cops. Cops ought to be more rough, right, when they're uh, arresting these black kids. Uh, you know, they ought to smash their heads on the way, they're putting them to the car and so on. So it goes on and on, and you know, just before uh, the midterms, uh, you know, he praised this guy Gianforte, right, the uh, Montana congressman who body slammed a reporter who was asking him a totally legitimate question uh, about health care. So, you know, we have a, a guy, a sort of violence promoter in chief, uh, who really has played that role. So, um, you know, uh, we're also seeing, obviously, polarization in a way that we haven't seen in a very long time. And I just think last night, everything you read about the election reinforces that. That, you know, it wasn't only, uh, you know, women and people of color and so on who won, right? On the Republican side, it was anybody who's a little bit moderate who lost, and it was the hardliners who won, the McSallies of the world. So, you know, I don't think there's any question that we're even more polarized than we were a couple of years ago. So, you know, we're in a place where uh, I think it goes without saying that these things are a genuine threat to democracy, uh, that the press is incredibly important uh, in terms of providing people with real information, and the press is under attack here in Hungary, in Poland, in Russia, my God, um, you know, in much of Europe. Uh, you know, remember that when Trump calls uh, the press the enemy of the people, that was a phrase coined by Joseph Stalin, right? That's where he's getting his ideas from, or God knows where he thinks he, they came from. Uh, again, you know, so I would say uh, this is not Germany in the 30s, but maybe it is a great deal like U.S. and the United States in the 1920s, meaning, I, you know, we still have a choice, right? I mean, the U.S. in the 20s ultimately did not go down the fascist road, although we had quite a lot of uh, proto-fascist groups uh, in the teens and 20s. Uh, so we're at that place. Um, and let me, in that context, just say briefly that, uh, you know, the, again, to return to the roles that leaders play, we know the role, and we've talked about some tonight, that Trump has played, but it's maybe worth remembering that Bush, who, you know, I was no fan of George W. Bush, but it is worth remembering that immediately after 2001, after the 9-11 attacks, uh, Bush came out and said not once, but many times, repeatedly, right, you know, our enemy, Muslims are not our enemy, Arabs are not our enemy. Our enemy is this very specific group, it's called Al-Qaeda. Uh, you know, and then he went and he stood in the National Cathedral and all kinds of religious settings like that, you know, his arm around some imam, that kind of thing. And, you know, while that looks all, you know, like a bunch of feel-good, you know, sort of frippery, actually it was incredibly important. Uh, you know, I've already talked about uh, hate crime numbers, but, you know, when 9-11 happened, to the surprise of absolutely no one, anti-Muslim hate crimes in the United States went up again, according to somewhat shaky FBI stats, 1,600%. And, you know, uh, it just doesn't seem like much of a surprise, right? 3,000 people have just been murdered in this unbelievable way. Uh, what was incredible was uh, that a mere three months later, right, when 2002 begins, the FBI stats for that year, they go calendar year by calendar year, show that in 2002, again, anti-Muslim hate crimes dropped by 67%. I, I I think that's rather remarkable. And that's a quite a drop. Uh, you know, the bodies are almost still cold. They're still warm, uh, you know, in, in lower Manhattan and so on. So, you know, again, I'm just arguing that it works both ways, right? Uh, a leader can make a, a big deal of difference uh, in both ways. So to sort of end up, you know, where, well, where are we? What can we do? You, you know, I mean, I think I've tried to say in a lot of ways that words matter. Words have consequences. Facts matter. Uh, and that, uh, for journalists, this is, you know, the core duty of the journalist, uh, to bring the real facts to people. Uh, you know, this is very much what, not only my work, but the SPLC's work at least tried to be about. I mean, we very often, you know, I know SPLC is known for suing hate groups out of existence and so on, but that was like a very small portion of the work. Uh, much more of it was, you know, outing people for their lives and often politicians, right? Because they're, in effect, enabling the groups, right? So if they say, you know, gay men are child rapists, right? I mean, that's not a harmless statement. In fact, it's an incredibly volatile one, and it's one people believe, right? So uh, facts matter, journalists matter. <laughs> Lord Northcliffe said once upon a time, you know, news is, some, news is something that someone wants suppressed. Everything else is just advertising. 
No kidding. Thomas Jefferson, were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate to prefer the latter. Walter Lippmann said, there can be no higher law in journalism than to tell the truth and shame the devil. And I don't think I need to tell you we're awash in devils right now. So, you know, what about the general public? I mean, I think that, you know, ultimately the only real answer is for people to be as educated as possible, to be critical thinkers, to learn how to think and evaluate what's going on in the world around them. Because, you know, you can't get all your facts uh, from Wikipedia, and you sure as hell can't get your facts from Tucker Carlson or Fox News, uh, or else you're operating in the wilderness. You don't know what is really going on. So, you know, I think it's important for the public to understand uh, how essential journalism is to democracy, to understand the difference between news and opinion, to understand the sources that people are using uh, to back their claims, uh, and to, to demand some transparency from journalists in terms of understanding how they're saying, uh, you know, this is the 6,254th lie of, of Donald Trump or whatever it is. Uh, you know, I guess I would just say as a last, uh, as a matter of sort of concluding, um, that, you know, uh, <laughs> sad to say, uh, human beings are not very perfect animals, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, you know, and I think that what we do uh, is what we try and do, or, or better angels, whatever, is to build up civilization uh, and apparatuses like the free press to essentially help us do better. Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, Thomas Hobbes gave this infamous, famous, sort of wonderful remark, Thomas Hobbes, the English philosopher, uh, saying, you know, man in a state of nature, right, without civilization is solitary, poor, or rather he said, life in a state of nature, is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Uh, so, you know, what I'm saying is that, you know, if we, if we abandon the norms of civilization, uh, that's what we have to look forward to. You know, I, just as a very last thought, you know, I think sometimes, you know, I hear the news today and, you know, they're all talking about civility and let's be nice and norms and so on. And in a sense, it sounds like real tripe. I mean, it's like, oh my God, civility. I mean, it just seems like so much to understate what's going on here. And yet, I think that that really is, uh, not necessarily civility, but, you know, these norms of civilization really are what hold us together. And I think, you know, it's that or the abyss. So with that uh, upbeat note, uh, let me say thank you. And, um, and I guess if there are questions, I'm not quite sure how we can organize those. <laughs> If Mark calls on you, would you please stand up, if you can, and speak loudly? We don't have a remote microphone in here, and it can be hard to hear in this room. And my hearing is particularly terrible, so. <laughs> so does anybody have any? Yeah. How do you think the mainstream media has dealt with Trump's lies and uh, yeah. I mean, I think pretty well. We were discussing this a little earlier tonight. I mean, I won't forget, uh, right after Trump was elected, I think that's when it was, when the New York Times finally ran a story saying Trump lied, and then they had a whole separate story about this idea that they were saying, you know, not that they, you know, that they didn't have the facts backed up or something, but they were calling it a lie. And, you know, and, and so I think the major press has done rather well in that way. And, you know, it's something. I mean, I think the Washington Post fact checker did just report today, I think, it, it, I think that number's right, something like 6,240 lies, right, since, since he took office, right? Forget the campaign. Uh, it, it's rather amazing. Could they do better? Yeah. Uh, but I think that the, the, main pro the main problem is not the New York Times and the Washington Post. It's, it's Fox News, it's Tucker Carlson, and it's an enormous apparatus, and, you know, it's been called an, an echo chamber, and it is kind of, except that the ideas, so many of them really originate in groups that are, you know, want to send Jews to the gas chambers. I mean, really, groups that are really out there. So, you know, I mean, I, I think, thinking back, of, I just think the Washington Post and the New York Times have broken almost every major story uh, about Trump, every really critical story. And, you know, one thing, I mentioned this earlier tonight, but. You may remember a few weeks ago, the Times did a huge takeout on uh, how Trump and his daddy made all this money. And it, it 
by being gangsters was the answer. And you know, Trump said at the time, uh, he says, boring story. And you know, the sad thing is, there's something to it, right? And not a lot of people are, there's like a 20,000 word story, right? Not a whole lot of people are gonna read that story. Um, and you could see it got no traction, not really, right? I mean, that's never been an issue. Yeah, yeah, and it was on the website forever, right? It just could get people to read it. Yes, sorry. No, I just, we can't hear what the question is. Oh. I, I, I just said they, they reprinted the, he, I was just supporting his point that, uh, the, that good journalism doesn't always get the attention of the public. They did a 14,000 word story on the, uh, uh, Trump uh, uh, fraud, and then they reprint it as a special insert in the Sunday after that, and very little talk about it. Yeah. Wow, that was a lot to digest. Anyway, um, I, I've been a supporter of the Southern Poverty Law Center for decades, and uh, I'd just like to thank you. the heyday of the Ku Klux Klan everywhere. everywhere. I mean, there were four million members of the Klan in 1925. You know, there were 40,000 members during the Civil Rights Movement, and there are nowhere near 4,000 today. So yeah, it was the, by far the peak of the Klan power. I should have said that. Yeah. And that's, and they were very instrumental uh, in passing, in helping to pass the Immigration Act. They were a big part of that. So I just want to thank you again for everything you and me. So the Poverty Law Center has done. But uh, my question has nothing to do with that. It has to do with your Vermont connection, which I wasn't aware of before tonight. I assume you're related to the artist Andy Potok who went blind. Yeah, that's my father, right there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so if you could maybe uh, elaborate on that a little bit and... Uh, well, he's a great or, man, very <laughs> handsome, attractive by <laughs> him. Yeah. The girls come from everywhere to see it. <laughs> no, I mean, we moved here, um, I didn't, I'm not, we're not natives, not real natives. Uh, we moved here when I was eight, which would have been 63, I guess. And I lived here, you know, I went to Marsh Plain Elementary School for a couple of years, and then I went to like this hippie school, parents cooperative free schools, so the free school in, uh, in Plainfield. And, uh, and then I went off to college and I never came back. <laughs> so, but, um, but nothing, but my wife and I are thinking of moving back, you know, getting old and gray, and looks like everybody else is up here too, so. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, well, Southern Poverty Mission said, I, I, I'm not sure I can, it's like seeking justice, you know, promoting equality, something else. <laughs> fighting hate, fighting hate, seeking justice, something about equality. So, I'm not, not much of a uh, an advertising copy, but yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, SPLCs did, I mean, has done a hell of a lot. And I left them uh, about a year and a half ago. So I've been working on my own for about a year and a half, but I mean, it's after 20 good years, so I don't have anything bad to say about them at all. Yeah. So, you can hear me. I teach at Champlain College. I teach at what they call the core, which is social science. Of course, you know what he made But here's the problem that uh, I think hearing, you know, you talk about 
Uh, you know, generally skip uh, the truth, uh, trying to get the facts, etc., etc. This audience, with, I don't see anybody in that generation of 20 year olds or whatever, 4 year olds. They don't read the newspapers. They don't listen to the news. They don't watch it. They wouldn't even know who Tucker Carlson is, I can tell you. They don't listen. A vile human being for anyone who doesn't know. What I'm saying is, I mean, I've been dealing with this for, for a number of years as a teacher there. They, they barely know what's going on in the world, and I really emphasize that. So they wouldn't even know if it's fake news because they're not even aware of it. Well, you know, I think there's a lot of truth to that, but I would say one thing, which is that I, I think, I mean, I feel like 10 years ago, journalism was in terrible trouble. And, you know, of course, this was the peak, right, of newspapers being plowed under by competition from, you know, online sources and so on. And, uh, and I think it's changing. I, I think that there are more, I mean, I do, not a lot, but some speaking to colleges, and um, I, I just think there are more and more young people now getting into it. Now, I agree with you, so I know, I mean, you know, I can't talk to my own son about politics because <laughs> some of the things he says, you know, I mean, I don't even know how to tell him how ridiculous it is, and it's for that reason, you know. The only thing that he gets that's real news is, you know, it's Vice News, and all the rest is, you know, stuff from YouTube. So, so, yeah. I'm sorry, when what was? Commercialists. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, that's very much what I was about but with the intelligence report, our magazine. I mean, if, if sorry, that, that's very much what I tried to do with the intelligence report. I mean, you know, it's only, it's a fairly big magazine, you know, about 400,000 paper readers and uh, how many online, maybe a couple millions. Um, and we did have a sort of mocking tone. You know, but, I mean, look, there have been a lot of attempts, right? I mean, Al Gore tried to build a, a radio network and it really fell apart. You know, now I guess we have MSNBC, so that's better than not having any sort of anything at the other end uh, from Fox. You know, I think in many ways that a lot of the future is probably in these things like ProPublico, right? I mean, these uh, non-profit collectives, uh, one way or another, that form to, you know, to provide good news. I and mean, ProPublica is really a good example, but there are a number of these efforts. So I don't know, you know, what the future is and how they're going to do. But, you know, when we were building up the intelligence report when I was there these 20 years, that's very much what we had in mind, right? We, we wanted to be part of a new kind of press that wasn't necessarily, you know, a for profit newspaper. In our case, we were a nonprofit. So, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. The stories that you shared with regards to conspiracy. Yeah. The, the stories that were shared earlier about conspiracy um, and the, the hatred that stems from them is, um, is, is rather poignant. But there's a word that you used early in your talk that keeps bouncing around in my head, and that is gullibility. Um, you, you said that, that as humans, we tend to be rather gullible. I wonder if, and toward the end of your talk, you talked a little bit about what we might need to combat such gullibility. Might you talk about that a little further, um, and especially with regard to the divide? Um, and there are many divides, actually, but the divide between red and, 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 and blue, the divide between north and south. Um, but that, that gullibility that, that seems to, seems to um, keep us from um, being able to work well together. <coughs> well, I mean, what I'm saying is, you know, that's a bit of human nature, right? That, that you know, that these sexy false stories travel faster than other kinds of stories. So, you know, that's a problem uh, that's hard to get around. I mean, I, I look, I think at the end of the day, and I really just barely uh, refer to this, but at the end of the day, you know, it's sort of a citizenship thing, right? I mean, you have to learn to, to be a critical thinker. I mean, it doesn't mean you have to be a news nut. 
and, and know everything about every you know, race that's happening in every state, but it means you have to learn uh, to separate uh, falsehoods. I, I don't know. We were having the same conversation I said earlier to me and right before this, and in some ways, you know, I think it's pretty easy, right, when you start to look uh, at what some of these websites claim uh, to see that they're, they're false. On the other hand, obviously, there are a whole bunch of people who take them completely seriously. I guess all I could really say in answer to the question is, I read a study, I mentioned this too earlier, but I read a study pretty recently, which basically made the case uh, that as soon as you say to someone, you know, you must be a racist because you voted for Donald Trump, or you must hate women, that's it, right? No more information is accepted from you. So that's not really my style. I'd rather tell somebody what they are right to their face. But apparently the science is, it's not, it's a very poor way uh, of convincing people of anything. And you know, I mean, I will tell you that this is sort of a little bit of a secret, but I've been um, talking to a guy uh, who's you know, a very major uh, Nazi leader, arguably the most important one in the country in the last 20, 30 years, for about a year now. And um, you know, <laughs> we still can't really talk about the Holocaust, right? His father was in the Waffen SS, and he doesn't believe it, right? And um, you know, so we'll see. But um, anyway, that—I that, don't know if that's useful or not. But I, you know, while it's a little disheartening because, boy, that sure sounds like the slow way, right? You have to just tell a person just how dumb they are, how wrong they are. It doesn't work. So you know, I guess that's one piece of the answer. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, are there any properties in the internet which have um, enabled a lot, of, a lot of fake news? What in the internet do you see as, as characters of elements of the internet that has, that has exploded the amount of fake news? Well, almost everything about it. I mean, you know, look at the way uh, most of the, uh, I mean, I said I write for the Daily Beast from time to time now. Still, you look at the Daily Beast, it's basically a news aggregator. I mean, they run a lot of their own stories. Uh, but like so many of these places, they just collect quote unquote news or stories from other places. So, you know, a very small proportion uh, of these sites that are giving you news actually report that news, or they might make a phone call or something. So it allows that kind of, pardon me, that sort of half assed journalism, that half assed excuse for journalism to pose as real journalism. And then, you know, obviously, it also allows uncontradicted uh, uh, falsehoods all the time, right? If you're on the Daily Star website, well, who's, who, you know, you don't need to let anybody on to say that uh, the Holocaust really did occur or something like that. Uh, and it's the same with all of these other groups I mentioned, like the Family Research Council, the American Family Association, which, you know, are seen in much of the country as great Christian defenders of the family, right? Period, without any caveats at all, but which I would argue, you know, they're scum. I mean, they're, they're, they're liars who uh, spend all of their time defaming uh, a large group of very vulnerable people and absolutely shameless about it. So, you know, there's that. There's since I mentioned earlier the anonymity, right? I mean, when Julia, Julia Ioffe, the Jewish, Jewish writer I mentioned, you know, she had, she had to move out of her house after she published, even if some of you remember this, she published a very mildly critical uh, portrait of Melania Trump back in Slovenia, what, you know, who her parents were and so on. And you know, she had pictures of her in the gas chamber sent to her, and, you know, death threats phoned to her, her home and so on. So, I mean, I think, you know, I'm not, I'm not entirely down on the internet either. I mean, one of the things we were talking about again earlier, earlier meeting was the, uh, I'm sorry, it was Wikipedia. You know, I think Wikipedia has gotten much better. Uh, you know, it's not, you know, it's not a source you could rely on, like an encyclopedia or something. But there's a lot of information in Wikipedia, and if you have any get up and go, you know, and you follow a few of the uh, links, you know, it's pretty easy to understand if they've got it right or wrong on a particular point. So, you know, it's not all it's not all bad. But um, yes, I think the internet absolutely makes this stuff possible, you know, and, and it makes it travel faster. I mean, you know, the Minutemen didn't hear about the planned Odslan by meeting Glenn Spencer at his, you know, trailer in, in southern Arizona. They read about it on the internet because he's got a website, he looks like he's a real organization, and he is, he's, you know, one little rabid, you know, anti-Semitic, immigrant-hating nut, right? But via the internet, you know, it's now believed, the planned Odslan is now believed.
I think literally, by a few million people. Can you do one more question? Sure. Okay. One more question? Thank you. Um, what role do you think that our public education system has in um, getting our students to be critically thinkers or not uh, getting them to be critical thinkers? Well, I mean, it has the biggest role, a really important role. I, I mean, I'll just answer with one little example, which is, you know, I live in the South now, right? Deep South, Alabama. Can't get any deeper than that. And, uh, you know, Southern schools still teach the Civil War in a way that's unbelievable. Well, this is, it's unbelievable because it's not true, right? So it is still taught very much as the lost cause. Uh, you know, it's still uh, very rarely where you hear in a public school in Alabama uh, that the Civil War was over slavery. And I'm sorry, you know, no, no matter, you know, if you read any kind of serious history, there's just no question, right? It wasn't the industrial system, it wasn't tariffs, it wasn't, you know, the imposition of godless materialism on Southerners by miserable Yankees. It was the slave system. And, you know, and so that goes, that goes on to cause all kinds of other things. I mean, in this memorial controversy, you know, Nathan Bedford Forrest is painted as a hero in the South, um, even in public schools. And it's true that if you know anything about him, Nathan Bedford Forrest was you know, a hell of a cavalry general. I mean, an amazing warrior, and the worst kind of human being to walk the earth, right? I mean, he had been become a millionaire uh, before the Civil War, running a slave yard in Memphis, an infamously uh, brutal slave yard. He presided over the massacre, uh, over uh, several hundred surrendering black Union troops. Uh, this was an illegal massacre. They'd already lifted the white flag. Uh, in Fort Pillow, Tennessee, and then after the war, Forrest became the first national leader of the Klan. But you don't hear any of that, right, in, in Alabama or Mississippi or Georgia public schools. You know, what you hear is, is the idea that, well, you know, maybe slavery had something to do with it, maybe, but it's barely mentioned, but, you know, essentially the Civil War was this noble fight um, from people with great principles in Northern Heaven. So uh, and that's just one example, but, you know, that's the kind of you know, that does not help you become a critical thinker, right? Because it's absolutely false from A to Z. Anyway, and fortunately for us, we got to hear a lot of things about news and fake news and real things. So thank you very much, Mark. Well, thank you for it.